quiet. It's time for us to begin this morning. I'm going to start, start off as best I can. I'm going to try to do this without crying, y'all. But, you know, from time to time, people send things to the church. And uh, people that we don't know, we don't have any idea, anything about them. But I got a letter uh, today, or yesterday, and I want to read this to y'all, and, and this, is, this is really touching to me. I mean, we, we get a lot of things from people that we don't even know uh, that reaches out to the church, and, and I know Roy needs to hear this too. Uh, but it says, Dear Pastor McCurdy and church members, I am Conchella Mark. Our sister Bonnie, a pure God sin for me. She have kept me in food plus love and kindness. Only God is son. Jesus Christ can put someone in your life like that. I watch your brief lessons and love them. I send a small donation to the Lord's church. There's five $100 bills there. It says, she says, it's from my heart. I am 100 years old. I don't know what old people do or think. I still work very hard, and no one wants to help other people, older people today. But believe me, the lessons that I hear are things that impress me and help me to continue to live my life. My own children, no phone calls come in, but I see those things about God. My Jesus told in his word that he would never leave me or forsake me. Who can harm you when I am near? That's good enough for me. Please continue to pray for me and thank you for your love and your prayers and your simple lessons that I myself can understand. Pray that I may walk upright and stand upright. I love you all. A sister in Christ, Conchella Mark. So, Y'all think about, I mean, you know, 100 years old. And sometimes I get these things that, I'm going to go ahead and put it in a plate there, Ellen. But sometimes I get these things at, uh, at home. And, you know, you just don't think about from time to time what God's word might mean to somebody. Uh, I was flattered by yesterday. Many of you know they had a Trump rally and had all the dignitaries from Alabama and senators and everything, and I got a call and said, Brother McCurdy, said, we, we'd love for you to come and, and say our prayer to start us off, Sandy and them, and so it was really nice. And so, you know, we hope and pray that everything goes well. We all do. But let's start this morning with our lesson and try our best to, yes, Is that right? That's something. All right, let's talk about a subject called backsliding. Now, I've did this before, but I hope and pray that we can, <laughs> we can look at this from the standpoint of, of how important it is to understand this. We don't want to forget we're going to start off with a prayer. Bruce, start us off, please. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your grace name. We thank you, Father, for this beautiful Lord's Day. For this opportunity we have to come together and worship you, study your word. Father, we hope that all we do today is done in the way that you would have us do it, pleasing in your sight. Now, blessing to those that hear it here and abroad. We thank you, Father, for loving us so much that you would send your Son to die on the cross for our salvation. We hope that we take all advantage of that, to, that uh, sacrifice so that we can spend eternity with you one day. Father, we want to say a special prayer for this woman that sent us the letter. Bless her and keep her close to you, Father. Strengthen her and live out her days with joy. We ask you to be with us through this lesson today. Be with the teachers in the back. Help all of them have a good recollection and a good lesson and that we open our ears and our hearts and take it deep inside and, and use it to better our lives. Go with us, guide, go and direct us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 
Amen. Yesterday, for a brief time, one of the fellows there asked me a question. He says, uh, you're a church of Christ, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, and and y'all don't believe in that once saved, always saved business, do you? And I said, no, sir, we don't. And he said, well, he said, I'm saved and I never look back. And so I thought about that, you know. I hope we're all to a point where we're saved and we, we don't want to look back, but we need to think about something called backsliding. And, you know, it's easy to do. And, you know, some of the things that we, we're going to talk about this morning are things that most of the time all of us in this room have, under, have encountered in our life. Let's go to the Old Testament first, like I always do, go from the Old to the New. Go to Deuteronomy 8 and verse 11. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 11. Let's see now. Brent, you want to start a song? Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Okay. Now, in this passage, he uses the word forget. He said, you be careful. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. Now, I'm of the opinion that sometimes we may very well find ourselves in a situation where we're doing good for a while, but for some reason or another, we kind of let it slide, and we forgot. Anybody ever have that happen in your life? You just kind of forgot. And, you know, sometimes it may need to be called to remembrance, to remembrance. And that's why we're here today in an assembly like we're in today. It's my job, as best I can, in a feeble effort, no doubt, to remind everybody in this room how important it is to serve God, live a Christian life, and go to heaven when this life is over. So in this passage here, he says, you beware. Now, you know, everybody knows what beware means. What's that mean? That's right. Look out for it. Pay attention. Pay attention. Now, you beware that you forget not the Lord thy God. Don't let a day go by. Don't let an hour go by. If you can help it, not to think about how blessed we are to have life and to be able to come together, to be able to study God's Word, to be able to live through the day, to be able to make our living, to be able to be with our family and to enjoy this thing called love. You know, it's an important part of being a Christian. Now, the Bible does indicate something of major importance when it comes to our subject today. Proverbs 14, 14, Proverbs 14, 14, a passage of Scripture that most all of us are, needs to be aware of. Let's see, Rita, you want to read that? The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own race, and the good man shall be satisfied for himself. Okay. The word backslider. He said, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own way. You know, what does God say about his way? My ways are higher than your ways and greater than your ways. You know, the Lord's way is the best way. But you know, the backslider, the person that decides... Well, I, I really and truly believe that, but you know, I, I have a tendency to think that I'm okay. And whenever a person gets to a point where they're a little bit deceived within themselves, it's easy to become a backslider. Somebody that really and truly has just cast aside God's will and decided that they might know a little bit better. And you know what? They don't. They don't. And so the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. And so we need to be very cautious and careful about not letting our ways override God's ways. God's ways is greater than our ways and higher than our ways and better in every aspect than our ways are. Let's look at another verse of Scripture. Can I read a verse? Yes, you can. Chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the way of death. So just what that guy said to you, that verse. That's exactly right. There's a way that seemeth right. And you know, there are a lot of people out there that think they're all right. 
They think they're all right. They say, you know, God is merciful, he's kind, and he's loving, and he is. Don't get me wrong. But if God says you have to do certain things to be in accordance with his will, don't you think we ought to do that? I mean, that's just the bottom line. Don't you think we ought to do it? If God said do it, we ought to do it. And I've argued the point with people for years, you know, and sometimes I try, I try never to be antagonistic or mean or ugly. But when people says, well, you know, Gary, I, I've been saved, and I, I know I'm going to stay saved, and I know I'm going to heaven. I don't know. Sometimes people get their ideas and their ways, and they put them in front. There's a way that seemeth right. And, you know, that's the way they look at it. And it's not. Let's look at another passage. This is a, a, a pretty old passage of Scripture. In Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel, this is a pretty, pretty hard book sometimes for people to find. But Ezekiel chapter 3, verse number 20, some of you are looking up on your phone. If you already have it, raise your hand. Okay, David. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you did not give him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. Now, first of all, when David read that, you'll notice in the first part of that, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness, I guess in the sense of being a commoner, as people refer to me sometimes as, I am a commoner. I can understand something like a righteous man turning from his righteousness. That's somebody that's doing good things, have been doing good things, and then all at once the wheel runs off, and they don't do good things no more. And they turn away. And, you know, I baptized an individual one time, never mentioned anybody's name. I baptized this person, did a long time talk to them about trying to get their life straightened out, and they was having problems and did. Come forward, and I baptized them. Come faithful, faithful for at least a month. And then one day they didn't show up. I thought, well, something's going on, you know, but I waited and didn't show up the next time. So I stopped by the house. And he said, well, I'm still good. I'm still good. I said, you are? I said, we missed you at church. He said, uh, well, you know, Gary, I've been thinking. I, I don't think you have to go to church to go to heaven. I just really don't. I said, well, now, you know, we may need to look at some things in the Bible and see. Oh, no, no, no. I don't, I don't think, you know, he said, I know what my, I feel in my heart. Have y'all ever heard that before? I know what I feel in my heart, okay? Do you know a heart can be deceiving? I can prove that to you from the Bible. You know, a heart can be deceiving. Well, in all honesty, y'all, this is when a righteous man turns from righteousness. That doesn't all, the way, all together mean just a man. We're talking about a human being. We're talking about man or woman of the age of accountability. Turn away from their good ways and turn into bad. And that's what backsliding really and truly constitutes in life. Now, Matthew 5, verse 13. Jeff, we're going to call on you on this one. Matthew 5 and verse number 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his touch, Savior. Savior. Wherewith shall it be salted? It is this force good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of man. Now, somebody says, what do you mean salt lost its savor? I don't know about y'all, but I can understand that. I like salt. Y'all like salt? Everybody likes salt on their stuff? You know, sometimes we do. Well, what if we salted it and we didn't get no taste out of that salt? It lost its savor, didn't it? It lost its usefulness. That's the point I want to make. It lost its usefulness. So it needs to be cast out. Throw it outside and go to the store and get you another box. But you see, we're talking about a Christian. 
A Christian that loses their way, a Christian that loses their value in serving God. If that salt loses its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? He said, and this is, this is sad. This is hard for people to understand and grasp. He said, it's thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. You know, I have seen some individuals before that I myself have said, and, and I shouldn't have said it because they have a soul. I have said, that individual is worthless. Well, I shouldn't say that. I need to repent of that. But my looking at that individual caused me to think that because they didn't do anything. They didn't work for a living. They didn't do anything good for anybody. They didn't do anything good for themselves. Didn't do anything good in life. They just trashed their life. Anybody know anybody like that? Sometimes it happens, doesn't it? And it's good for nothing but to be cast out, trodden under the foot of men. Somebody said, well, now you're being cruel. When you stand before God, it's going to be, when you stand before Jesus, not God. He's God too, but stand before Jesus. He's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or he's going to say, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. Now, what causes that? Backsliding is, is a dangerous thing. Once you get in, you stay in. Once you get connected, you stay connected. Once you learn the truth, you stay with the truth. But if you fall away, there's always a, a way to come back. And, and that's what we're going to get to in just a minute. There's always a way to come back. It's called repentance. Ever done anything you're sorry for? Most of us have, haven't we? There's nothing wrong with saying, God, I'm sorry. Because God accepts that. If you truly are, he accepts that. Let's go further. Uh, there's, a, there's an illustration made in the book of Mark, but let's get this next one, Daryl, that, that, that I called on you for. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them, and it yielded no fruit. Go ahead and read 15 and 16 while you're there, Daryl. It'll, it'll make a difference. And these are, and these are the, uh, oh, the side, 14 uh, are they by the wayside. Where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that is sown in their hearts. And these are they likely, likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Okay. We got some issues here. Some hear the word, they receive it with gladness, but then we see something here that really and truly sticks out. And I, when I'm thinking about this and looking at this and teaching the lesson in, in times past, he said some fell among thorns and, and it grew up but choked it and it yielded no fruit. Some people are serious when they first come to an understanding that they need to change their life. And they'll step forward and, and man, they'll, they'll confess Christ and they'll be baptized. But for some reason... The thorns overrun. These bad things that are in our society, they take hold on their lives. And you know what happens to them? It chokes them. And they just go ahead and move on. I can't tell you at the number of people that's come to me and said, why don't you, you know that so-and-so went to heaven. I said, no, I don't. No, I don't. I, it's not my job. I, I don't. When I preach a funeral, I don't, unless it's a little baby or a child uh, under the age of accountability, I can safely say, you know, I don't, I don't preach them into heaven or hell. It's not my job. I talk about the person and talk about what's good about them and, and the things that we want to know and, and, and things. But you see, this thing right here is I've preached people's funerals before that once was very faithful, was a child of God. And then for some reason or another, they turned away. I think the thorns grew, and I think it choked them. And when it happened and they lost their, their life, you know, I can't say. It's not for me to say. I mean, the Lord's the judge. But you see, we're talking about an illustration here of how sometimes backsliding is when the thorns get around us, when all the bad comes our way, and we let the bad over-influence the good. And that's, that's sad. 
Anybody got a thought or a comment? Look at Luke 9, 62. Let's see, Gabe, you, you're next to Daryl there. I don't want to make you feel bad. You go ahead and get that for me. Luke 9, 62. Now, y'all think about this for just a minute, what he's fixing to read when, he's, when this is read. But Jesus said to him, No one had him put his hand to the plow, and looking back, his fit toward the kingdom of God. Everybody in this room knows about putting your hand to the plow, I'm sure, understanding that principle. But if we're going to plow, we need to look where we're going, right? And if we look backwards, we may get off that furrow. We may not plow just exactly in the place we need to be plowing. Well, now, he uses a very crude illustration here. Somebody said, crude, understand what we're talking about. Gabe read there, no man having put his hand to the plow then looks back is even fit for the kingdom of God. You know what that means? That means somebody that got on board, obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, was doing good, but then for some reason they turned away. They turned back. They looked back. And you know what happened when they looked back? They got off track. And when they got off track, what happened to them? They became unfit for the kingdom of God. You know, that's a serious matter. None of us are perfect. We'll never be perfect. Well, I say now, none of us. I say the babies are in the back, aren't they? Okay. If they were here, I couldn't say that. Them babies are perfect. You know, they're already heavenly. But we're not. And we're looking at something that really and truly measures in our life. Backsliding. Getting on board, doing the right thing, and then turning away from it. Now, can we come back? We're going to get to that in just a minute. I hope my time's just nearly up. Let me skip about five or six of these right here real quick. Uh, in the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verse number 6, back to my left-hand side. Marilyn, could you manage that one for me? Galatians 1 and verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of uh, Christ unto another gospel. Okay. Now, Paul's writing to a church over here in Galatia. The Apostle Paul's writing this letter, and he's writing to them, and he said, look here, I, I marvel. You know what that means? I'm surprised. I'm shocked. That's what he's meaning. I am shocked. Well, what's he shocked about? He said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. You know, some people find a religion that best suits them. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Some people look for a religion that best suits them. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right, Brother Isabel. You know, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I don't really like the way y'all do things down there, so I, I'll go over here. Now, I like, I like this. Well, you know what's wrong with that? This is a man writing to a church that once obeyed the truth of the gospel, and then there come along some that says, well, you know, you ain't really got to do all what they said. You, we, we're going to go ahead and, and, and replace some of this with this over here. And he says, I'm shocked. I'm marvel that you're so soon removed. Must not have been long until after the church had been established over there in a the place called Galatia and the Christians had obeyed the gospel. Must not have been long until they decided they want to do something different. Let's go further real quick. Galatians 4, let's stay there with verse number 9. Galatians 4, let's stay there with verse number 9. Kathy? But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, have turned ye into the weak and beggarly elements, for unto ye desire again to be in bondage. Hmm. I like that verse of Scripture. I've got it marked several times, but he says, after you've known God, or rather you're known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements? Look at the descriptive terminology for the elements. Weak and beggarly elements. In other words, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not weak and beggarly. He says, I'm just, after that you have known God, or known of God. And you know, I, I've thought about that a lot of times. I have, I have family members, family members. 
that once went to church and once tried to live a Christian life for a short period of time. But now, don't even have any regard for the church, don't have no regard for any kind of a Christian life, don't have any regard for their soul. And that's, that's sad for me because those, that's family members. You know, all of y'all are my family, but I'm talking about actual blood family. And I worry about that, but you know what? I can only answer for me. And I can only teach it the way that the Bible puts it out there for me to be able to teach it. He says, look, after you know God and you're known of God, how, how in the world could you ever turn again to the weak and beggarly element? Things that's not worth anything. Went real quick. First uh, Timothy 6 Verse number 10, 1 Timothy 6, verse number 10. Brother Bragg, could you manage that one? For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Okay. He uses something that most people can understand. The love of money. We all want that. We all, you know, I've got 4 or $5 in my pocket today, and that's a good thing. You know, think about this. He says, the love of money is the root of all evil. And he said, and some people coveted after that. He says, they coveted after it after they erred from the faith. Don't let nothing ever replace the value of God, the value of the word of God, the value of this old book the value of fellowship, the value of Christian living. Don't let anything ever replace that in your life. That's the most important thing you could ever in a million years do. Just like this morning when we read that letter from the 100-year-old lady who sent the donation to the church. You know, she's serious about the church. She's serious about what she knows about the Lord. And those things are valuable. They... It's not anything that needs to be able to replace that. And why is that? I'll say this, and then our lesson will conclude for today. What does it profit a man? Y'all want to finish that? What does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and then lose his own soul? It wouldn't matter how much money we got. It don't matter what all we've accumulated. It don't matter where we're at in... Somebody says stigmatism. <laughs> one man, he brought that to my attention one time. I said, stigmatism. <laughs> he used it in a different way. But it don't matter what value we accumulate in life. It don't matter what importance we may become in life. It don't matter where we reach or what plateau we reach in life. If we lose our soul, y'all, we've lost it all. And, you know, that's, somebody says, what's the most valuable thing you have? And, you know, most of y'all know, I'd say, oh, my guns. You know, I love guns, you know. But that's not the most valuable thing. The most valuable thing I have is my soul. You as well. do not matter how much money you got. Your soul is worth a whole lot more. Jeff's shaking his head. He knows, too. What does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and then lose his own soul? He's lost it all. So backsliding, let it not be a part of our life. Don't let anything influence you. Don't let anything pull you away from serving and, and, and understanding the principles of living a Christian life and going to heaven when this life is over. My time is up. Is there any comments? We got two minutes.